look that up in your iPad or your book. Or I don't care what what a, a perversion you use. Just, just, just. Somebody got John 15, 8? Uh, read that for me, Rhonda. Herein is my Father glorified. Got it? You want to give glory to his name, is it? Go ahead. That you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciple. So that you bear much fruit. That's it. Apple tree bears apples. Sheep bears what? Sheep, not shepherds. If you give him a, a glory, you can bear much fruit. You bring in somebody else. Bring him in. Barbara went to an eye doctor this week, and uh, I uh, Google, you know, you Google eye. Uh, let me read you something. You ever had a, a, a binocular, and you got to keep turning that little knob to keep it focused? Your eye right now is constantly focusing distance, short stuff, constantly. Your eye has 150 million cells doing that stuff all of the time. There's a chemical that mixes with a protein. I've already way over my pay scale, and it works to works together. It's amazing camera. It's an amazing uh, deal. Charles Darwin wrote a book called Origin of the Species. Have you ever heard of it? Let me read you something for a minute. To suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection I must confess is, abs is absurd. Absurd. A-B-S-U-R-D. Charles Darwin says, to suppose that the eye came about by natural selection, quote, is the highest degree of absurdity. Now that one is never read from that same book, The Origin of Species. If I told you there was a hundred and fifty trillion wires, little cables, that by chance all fell together to make a great, huge computer operate, you would say that's crazy. That uh, over a trillion wires and cables could fall together in such a way that that computer would run. But they tell every day that's how your brain came about, which is still the world's greatest computer. Just the eye. And Barbara going to an eye doctor. It made me think, God wanted you to be. Go home and read Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, and tell me you're the same person. Proverbs 8, 22 to 31. Don't have time for that to this morning. But God is good. People, God is talking to you all the time, everywhere. If we just listen, take time out to listen. How do you get to God? Would you like to know how to get to God? What is there a formula? Is there some things you have to do to get something from God to get to God? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. And here's a man who wanted to get to God. And let's look at this story that we've heard over and over again. Let's look at it and see a bigger picture of how to get to God. How to reach God. 
Father, we thank you for the great teacher, the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he's here and he's bringing to our mind. He's working to reveal your will. And we want to praise you that you're speaking to us. In Jesus' name, we call it a done deal. Amen. Amen. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Elam. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given him victory to Aram, Assyria, uh, uh, and he was a valiant soldier. Now Barbara says, I don't say that right. She says, I'm saying this. You read it and you get it right. Seems to me like it says soldier. But she said, no. It's take the H out. Of it. But that's it is what it is, kids. But 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 he was a great man, valuable, respected, rich. You can tell that by all the money that he brings with him in him. He had wealth. He had fame. He was recognized by the government. He was a noble, valiant. But when I was in high school, Braxton, we would go home from school. Now, the cool kids watched uh, Dick Clark and American Bandstand, but I couldn't dance, so there was no need watching that. Uh, <laughs> if it was fun or fattening, Baptists couldn't do it. <laughs> but we would run home, son, to watch a soap opera in the afternoon uh, called Dark Shadows. Now, Dark Shadows was about a man named Barnabas, and you couldn't help but like him. Now, Barnabas was a cool dude. You liked him. He was nice. He was friendly. Uh, but he had one little flaw. One flaw. Uh, he was a vampire. And so at night, he would tell women, now don't get close to me, you won't like it. I'm gonna give you a hickey out of the world. And he said, uh, you stay away from me. And Barnabas uh, fought it, and he tried not to be that way. And he was always looking for the cure. And I always wonder why educated people got taken up with dark shadows. You could buy notebooks, lunchbox, I mean, everything, dark times. And I always wondered, why, why did that happen? See, I believe most of us believe we're about 90% okay. But I'm an alcoholic. I'm a good guy most of the time. But when I lose my temper, I got this temper. Other than that, you know, I'm the guy next door. I go to work, I pay my bills, but I got this problem with lust. I got this problem with pornography. I, I'm an okay guy, but I got this problem with drugs. Most of us see ourselves as about 90% okay, but if we're honest, I just can't help but lie. I will lie when telling the truth makes more sense. You ever known anybody like that? <laughs> now, don't think about your family members. Now, that's not right. I'm trying to get you to think outside of the box. And so Naaman was an okay guy, but he was a leper. Leprosy was a gradual thing. It was one of the worst things you can ever tell yourself, I'm going to do this just once. That's how sin uh, begins. And leprosy would carry your nerve cells. And you would look down and your finger would be black and dead. And it would rot off and fall. And then your whole hand, gradually, 
There was no cure for it. Leprosy was the curse of all curses. It was a slow death, painful death, isolation, leper colonies, decaying flesh. It was horrible. And there was nothing he could do. The first thing of getting to God is understanding that you need him desperately. Need him. And there is nothing else. Let me tell you about some people that I met in 22 years of grief counseling, okay? They come in and the husband had died or the wife had died and they are successful. They are professional people. They are college graduates. They have a nice home. And their ideal of wanting to be happy, see we all want to be happy. We all want to find peace. We all looking for something that is out there and there's a longing and we want to be okay, we want to be happy, we want to be satisfied. And their idea of happiness, of peace, they're not anti-God, they're not against God, it's just that they don't need a God. And they would, they would tell me, if people have a problem, if they have a drug problem, if they have a, some kind of moral issue, or, and they need a God, I'm all for it. But we don't need a God. We have made wise choices. We went to college. We got a degree. Then we saved up money. Then we got married. And then we got a 401k. And then we got our house in order. And we didn't do drugs. We didn't get head over here in debt. We didn't make stupid choices. Their God is making good choices. Then they got married and then they had kids. 24 six months apart. It was planned. I hear about people that plan pregnancies, but I personally never knew one. <laughs> our third child was born on our second child's first birthday. We got kicked out of Planned Parenthood over that little day. <laughs> but the book of Ecclesiastes is the man searching for happiness. And he makes good choices. Now, now love me, but we tell our kids, kids, don't be stupid. Don't do drugs. Don't buy things you can't afford. Don't date girls you wouldn't marry. Go to college. Get a job. Now listen to me, girls. If there's any girls out here, you look at that boy and you said, no job, no wife. Make that a rule. And don't be 30 years old living in your parents' basement. If you want to love like adults, live like adults. If you want to play house, make a house. Now that's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is this person comes to grief and they're cool. They're happy. They got the car, they got the boat, they got the house, they go on trips. Their life is okay. If you need a crutch, if you need a God, I, I'm not against it. It's just not for me. And then one of the spouses die. Now their brain tells them when you get married, two things are going to happen. You're going to lose them by divorce or you're going to lose them by death. That's it. They know people don't live, live forever. 
They know their spouse wouldn't want them to be unhappy. They know the one who died would want them to get up, pick up the pieces, and go on. You can't bring them back. They know all that. But they say, Brother Ralph, why can't I get up out of bed? Why can't I just tell myself, get up, get dressed, go on with your life? Why can't my brain fix this? Up to this point, my intellect has been my God. Good choices, good thinking, planning has always worked for us and has made me relatively happy and at peace. But now, I know it in my mind, but what is happening to me? And for the first time, they'll look at me and say, do you really believe what you preach? Do you really believe there is this supernatural, sovereign God out there? Because I can't fix myself anymore. I got all of this, but there's something inside. There is something bigger than I am. There is something going, maybe they're really, for the first time, they really explore the thought. Maybe there is a God out there. And they come looking. For the first time, they come to a place of their life of questioning, maybe there is something bigger than I am. Maybe there is a God. Maybe I'm 90% all together, but I got this flaw, I got this thing. Maybe we come to a place of understanding he had everything, but, and our first step of getting to God is really understanding that we have a need of him. But he had leprosy. Verse 2. Now bands of raiders from Syria had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, just for a minute, this little girl, at some point, even though she was a slave to them, even though they ruled over her, at some point, she became concerned about her master's health. At some point, she looked beyond her situation of where she worked, of the personality of her boss. She looked beyond the unjust, unfair situation she was in and somehow began thinking about and caring about somebody other than her own plot and her own situation and was concerned about her master. At some point, this little girl began to see that the world was bigger than her situation. And she somehow had compassion for her, her master and would see a prophet. Verse four, that's a story in itself. Naaman went unto his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go to the king. Uh, the king of Syria replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. At this point, Naaman said, How do I get to God? I buy my way. I earn my way. 
If I want to get in on good side, I've got to earn it. I got to work for it. I got to start doing good stuff. That's his first thought of how to get to God. And we think how to get to God is start going to church. Start reading my Bible. Start giving. Start being nice. Logical. So he loaded up all his money and he went from one king of Syria to the king of Israel. It was the government that controlled things. They look to the government for help. They have a problem, the government will fix it. I got a need, the government will provide. So he went from the king of Syria to the king of Israel. Same mental process. I go to the top. I go to the hierarchy. I, I go to where the power is. I go to where the control is. And the control is in the government. And they're my savior. They're going to fix it. They're going to the next entitlement, the next government program, the next free medicine, the next whatever coming on the mentality was not much different than it is now it only natural so he said i'll send a letter to the king one king to another king one top guy to the other top guy one par to the other power i go to the par struggle i go to the top okay let's go on verse six the letter that he took to the king of israel read with this letter, I'm sending you my servant, Naaman, to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Surely the top doe can fix it, the king. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Wouldn't it be nice if our government leaders were just a myth that there aren't God? Wouldn't it be nice just for them to say, is government God? Am I God? Why are you looking to the next uh, election? Why are you looking to the next change of presidents? Why are you looking to the next, and I wish our politicians would be as honest as the King of Israel was by saying, am I God? Can I fix your problem? Is this your savior? Is this who's gonna meet your needs? Can I heal and bring back to life? Why did this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a choir with me. The king of Israel knew he couldn't do it and he thought then the king of Israel would use that as a reason to to go to war. And Syria is already winning the, you know, the you know, battle. Verse 8. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had tore his robe, he sent him this message. Why have you tore your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know there is a prophet, not a miracle worker. Now there is going to be a miracle but Elisha didn't identify himself as a miracle worker. He identified himself as a prophet. And what does a prophet do? Preaches the word of God. Foretells, foreknowledge the word of God. He said what he needs is the word of God. Okay, verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariot, stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be a cleanse. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Step two, uh, how to get to God. Broken. <laughs> Humility. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. 
understand that you don't bring anything to the table. It's not a negotiation. He came out and Naaman came in front of the prophet and the prophet didn't even go out. Why? I believe he wanted Naaman to know that Naaman couldn't fix Naaman and Elisha couldn't fix Naaman. We elevate preachers up and we think some prophet, some person is where we need to go. Now I hope you understand what I'm not saying. You can call 1-800-TELFA. You can go and go. But listen to me. There is no reason that what God does someplace else, he cannot do in Caesar. He's the same God. Naaman couldn't fix him, and Elijah couldn't fix him. If Elisha had went out and waved his hands and made a big ado, Elisha could have taken the credit for it. It would have been Elisha. He would have had a card, get on TCT, have a ministry, write a book, and everybody will be running all over to go to Elisha, not to God. Elijah performed the miracle. And it says, where is the God of Elijah? We don't need to put our focus on God's Elijah's. We need to get our focus on Elijah's God. Big difference. And he said, you have to come out and have to be broken. Nothing wrong with tears. To get to God, you have to really understand how desperately you need Him. Because somehow in the back of our mind, I'm trusting my personality. I can talk my way out of this. I'm trusting my head. I can figure this problem out. I'm trusting my money. I'm trusting my position. Because I'm blankety blank blank so and so, they won't give me a ticket. I can buy my way out of jail. Somehow there is something inside of you that somehow still this small part that I did it my way. I'm the captain of my faith. I'm the master of my soul. I can be anything I want to be. It's up to me to turn this thing around. And see, that is true, but it's not the truth. If I'm going to make a counterfeit $20 bill, I don't put Mickey Mouse a face on it. I make it look like the real. And it's going to feel right. It's going to look right to make wise choices. i I got to turn this thing around. Nobody can do it but, but, but me. I got the 12 steps. I'm going to do the, if the, and I am for the 12 steps, but if the 12 steps could deliver you, Jesus died in vain. He would have told you, do the 12 steps and you'll be okay. You understand what I'm trying to say? These are good things, but they are not God things. There is a difference. And Naaman was angry and he said surely surely he would go down and wash in the Jordan that old muddy water he said anybody well I got all this money I bought all these all this money all these animals any idiot could go down and get in that muddy river a child could do it a dope addict could do it don't they know? It's me, Naaman. Any harebrained idiot, it doesn't take much to go down there and dip in that river. Anybody could do it. Yes. Whosoever will may come. See, Jesus didn't die for 
drug addicts. Jesus didn't die for adulterers. Jesus didn't die for prostitutes. Jesus didn't die for murderers. Jesus died for sinners. They tell me it's too easy. It's too easy. You make this thing too easy. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we come. Not through any human endeavor. Too easy. No. It's not too easy. It's too hard. It's too hard for you to publicly admit you can't fix it. I cannot make enough wise choices with enough time and enough money and enough knowledge I can turn my boat around and get out of this mess. All I need is a loan consolidation. All I need is a fancy lawyer. All I need is a new drug, a new miracle drug. It's too hard. It was too hard for that great, wealthy, famous man to admit that what God is asking of him, a child could do it. And nobody could do it. Don't they know who I am? Don't they know? And to come broken with nothing. That's hard, not easy. It's easy to think I can start doing good stuff and somehow, remember what the prodigal son said? The first prodigal son. Daddy, your hard servants got it better than me in this pig pen. And if you'll let me come back home, I'll pay you back. I'll work for you. That's our mentality. And Naaman said, so he turned and went off in a rage. Listen at the next verse. Verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be be a cleanse. We want you to do something. We want you to go. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Still got left. The second dip. Still disease three times four times five times the sixth time he came up and he was still rotten decaying stinking flesh what would happen if he got up and walked out of the river You could be on the brink of a mirror. You could be on the fifth dip. Don't quit praying for that family member. You could be on the sixth dip. Don't give in to the temptation to quit. Don't give in. How do I get to God? Naaman said, I want to go to find this God. I confess my need of Him. Really, my need of Him. I am, cannot do this on my own. There's no good thing within me. 
But doesn't God have any standards? Doesn't God, I mean, He's holy. And you mean anybody can just come and believe and ask Him? Doesn't He want us to do something before we come? Doesn't He have any standards? Doesn't He require anything? Yes. Yes. They sent him to the prophet. Remember? They said, go to the prophet. Remember when Jesus was on the road of Emmaus and those two guys came up along and talked with him? He declared unto them everything that the law and the prophets in the Old Testament told about the one who was coming who would meet God's standard, who would be holy enough, who would be perfect enough. See, Naaman couldn't have done it. But there was somebody, a prophet was coming, that would be good enough, that would be perfect enough, that would be sinless enough to meet God's standard. And Jesus lived the life you couldn't live, died the death you should have died, bore the wrath of God, so that we could then identify with him. When God sees me, he does not see me as Ralph Brandon. He sees me as Ralph Brandon covered in the blood of Jesus. I approach God through the high priest, the one and the only mediator between God and man, this man, Jesus Christ. Jesus bore the standard. He was the one. And so I identify with him to find God. I pray in the next few minutes that the Holy Spirit will open our eyes and we can see we got all this. We're 95% a good guy. We got everything, but there is this secret room in my mind that nobody knows about. Nobody sees me in that secret room, my hidden. Nobody knows. All they see is the man of valor and wealth and success and okay and a nice guy and laughing all the time and everybody but there is this part that I desperately need God to touch in my life. And it's not about me earning it, making a big show, having a big ado. It's so simple that it's so hard for me to come as a child, broken, with nothing I bring, and to come and to surrender, all in, all in, all seven dips, all in, not part of me. I'm going to start doing better if you'll do this, if you'll do that. All of me, I surrender all. How do you get to God? Broken, humility, all or nothing. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the living word will bring the written word to life. Draw us unto yourself and that the power of the gospel, the good news, changes everyone in this room from the inside out. Open our eyes and reveal our need of you. Open our hearts that we humble ourselves just to bring our brokenness, to let you take something broken and make something beautiful out of it. 
You are the potter. I am the clay. As we yield ourselves totally unto you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Ladies. The Bible says if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth. Coming forward does not save you. But I think that confession of what I prayed on the inside. If you're here this morning and just want to say, you know, I want to be a seven dipper. I want to be all in. It seemed like I got my foot, one foot in heaven and one foot on the earth. But this morning, I'd just like to make a statement before God and men that I, my heart's desire is to be a seven different, to be all in for Jesus, just to give him my all. Now, he can take me. I, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what he wants me to do. But this morning, there's something in my heart that draw me, and I just want him to know, I need thee. I need thee every hour, every day. I need thee. And I just want to reaffirm for myself that I want to be a seven dipper. I want to be all in. I just want to surrender to him. And whatever the Holy Spirit is leading, sometimes we can pray for you. And sometimes we just need to pray with you. If any two would agree, if there's something going on in your life and you just would like us to come into agreement with, to pray with you. If there's something you would like us to pray for, just feel free to do that. Uh, one of the beauty of, this, of, the, of the tables, just ask somebody there with you, somebody at the table, say, would you join with me? Um, we got a family uh, choice, family decision coming up. I, I've got a need. Just wouldn't it be wonderful if around these tables every Sunday we would just see God moving working in our lives and transforming us. Just, it's, hey, that's same girl. 